Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from AnthonyMorganti.com. This is episode 3 of Learn Lightroom 6, also called Lightroom CC. In this episode, I'm going to process this color image into a black and white image. So, as you can see, I'm already in the develop module of Lightroom. And what I like to do is I like to maximize my workspace. And how I do that is I'll hit Shift Tab. It gets rid of all the side panels in the top and bottom panel. And I'll go to the right panel and open that. And that's the way I do it. It's just faster for me to do it that way. Now, the first thing I notice is the image is crooked. And I've showed you how to straighten the image before by going to Lens Corrections and clicking on Auto. Well, what you'll find in Lightroom, there's often multiple ways to do the same exact thing. And a lot of times one way will work better than another way in one image, but then in a different image the other way works better. So I'm going to show you two different methods than I showed you previously on how to straighten this image. We're going to go up to the tool strip and the very first tool is the crop tool. And if you open that up, you'll see these grid lines come on the screen. We'll talk more about these um, composition overlays later, but right now you'll just see these grid lines are here. That means the crop tool is open. And you see down here it says angle. If I click on this little tool, it looks like a level. If I click on that, you'll see when I bring it up over the image, I have the cursor changed into that level. And what I could do now is I could draw a line, either horizontal or vertically, across the image that should be horizontal or perfectly vertical in the scene. Now, when you're doing a landscape, that often will be the horizon line. And you can see I have a chunk of the horizon line here. And it's kind of going across over here. So I'm going to grab it like right at the top of this break wall here and go across best I can. See it? it looks to be about there. And all I got to do now, you can see I drew a crooked line because I'm just going across the crooked horizontal of the horizon. Now I let go and you can see the image automatically straightened. And if you have this little padlock locked, it will keep your dimensions. In this case, it was shot with a Nikon D800E, which is a full sensor camera. And that is a 3 to 2 uh, aspect ratio on the image. So I like it uh, the way it is. So I could just close the crop tool and it will keep the, um, the straightening as, as I just did it. Another way you could do it is you could open the crop tool and if you see if I bring my cursor just outside of the frame of the image you see how it turns into a curved double arrow line? Well if I click down with the left mouse button you see this grid pattern comes up and that you could now just move your mouse left, right, up, down, whatever to straighten the image to your eye and you know these um, grid pattern helps you do that and as you can see that it's probably right about there so that's a good straightening um, of this image here so I'm gonna close that down so now the image is straight enough let's put it that way alright now I'm gonna go and I wanna convert this to black and white you could do it later in the process. You could do it at the beginning of the process. Personally, I prefer to do it at the beginning of the process. And as I mentioned, there's multiple ways to do the same thing in Lightroom. I'm going to show you three different ways, and I'm going to show you the way I prefer to do it last. Um, you could go to the basic panel, and you could go to saturation slider right here, and you could just turn saturation all the way down. And that gives you a black and white image. But I don't like that way, so we're going to undo that. The other way is if you look right here at the top of the basic panel, it says color, and right here is black and white. If we click on black and white, it made it black and white. And that's a decent way, but I don't prefer that way either. So I'm going to put it back to color. The way I prefer to do it is I prefer to go to the HSL Color B&W tab and click on B&W. Now I prefer to do it this way because as you can see below it gives us the black and white mix and what this is every color that is in the image could be now adjusted with the sliders well you're saying it's black and white who cares well you're not really adjusting so much the color you're adjusting the luminance of what that color was meaning uh, the sky you know there's probably blue in the sky 
So you could go to this blue slider. It's currently at plus six. And if I move it to the right, you can see the sky will get brighter. If I move it down, the sky will get darker. And you see it's not really affecting much else beside the sky. So uh, that is why I prefer it here. Now I could come in here with these sliders and I could adjust different things. Now I, I think there was some grass in here. So you could go to the green and yellow slider. That usually is what will adjust grass. And I could turn it up. And the green isn't doing too much. It's doing a tiny bit in here. In the yellow, you can see, and the yellow is affecting the sky also. And as I turn it up, it's actually adding a little more detail up in here. So these sliders come in really handy. Now on some images, they'll be more effective than others, but that is why I convert it uh, to black and white with this panel. Now I'm going to leave it alone for now. I'm going to come back to that. So I converted it to black and white. That's what I usually do, and I usually leave the sliders alone at the beginning. And then I go up to the basic panel to do the major adjustments. I come back to those sliders in the B&W uh, panel to do some minor tweaking, and you'll see what I'll do in a minute. All right, now this image here, it's underexposed, as you can see again, because it's really a backlit scene. I didn't so much purposely underexpose it like I normally might do, it was naturally going to be underexposed. I didn't do anything to compensate for the backlight. I did that on purpose because I want as much detail in the sky as possible. And when I was here, these sun rays were really prominent, I'm much more prominent than they look right now. So I want to bring those out. And also, it was an extremely cold, cold day. I was freezing. So I can't portray that in the image as much, but we'll see what we can do. Um, first thing I'd like to do now is the highlights. Now, as you know before, we brought highlights all the way down, shadows all the way up. Well, now we're on episode three, so I'd like you to start thinking for yourself a little bit. Instead of doing all these mechanical adjustments I showed you, may, you know, don't be afraid to, let's reset those by double clicking on the name, don't be afraid to go to them and just move them around like a little bit, left, right, and see where you like it better. So I like it better turned down. So we're just going to keep turning it down and maybe around like, I don't know, minus 60 right now. Now I could come back and readjust that. Now let's go to the shadows. We're going to move that around. Now it's not affecting the sky as much and I'm I'm right now I'm actually looking at the sky more so than anything else because I really want to bring out the prominence of these, um, these rays coming through the clouds. But as I adjust the shadows, I see it's really opening up where the, um, the uh, building is and the ground around it. So I you know, really want to bring that up also. So around 78 looks good on that. Now I'm going to go back to highlights and I'm going to tweak that a little bit. And I see as I bring that down a little bit, it's bringing out a little more detail in the sky. So I'm really almost at minus 100, but I'm going to leave it right there for now. now as you may remember, it's my habit to skip whites and blacks right now and go down to clarity. And I'm going to turn the clarity up. That should really enhance the sky. And I'm turning it up quite high. So plus 85. That is probably ridiculously high. I'm going to zoom in by clicking down and drag around. And I can see if I added noise. And there is some noise there. This is a D800E with a very large sensor. Um, what happens though with clarity too is you see how we're getting this kind of white ring kind of around the building like particularly right in here and here that's what will happen if you mess with contrast and clarity and you turn them up a little too high you'll get like a white fringe around uh, buildings and trees and things now it doesn't seem too bad it seems to be really pretty much right here in this blackest part of the tower or the light tower here and I'll uh, uh, the edges of the cloud. So I'm not really worried about it. I'm going to leave it alone. So I have clarity very high. Um, you can see now vibrance and saturation are turned off because I'm in black and white uh, mode that we did earlier. Now I'm going to turn contrast up to further enhance the sky. Now one thing I want to dissuade you from doing is avoid getting the sky too black. A lot of uh, times I see some black and white images, even color images in the sky, the clouds, the storm clouds are like black, ink black. And actually, if you look at nature and you're out 
you know, looking at the clouds, the darkest clouds are going to be dark gray. They're almost, I mean, never black. I've never seen a black cloud. So you don't want to go too crazy uh, with the contrast and the um, clarity, so much so that you're making the clouds absolute black. You want to avoid that unless you're going for some surreal, you know, look. All right, now the whites and blacks. Now, as you know, typically I like to hold the Alt or Option key. Alt if you have a PC, Option if you have a Mac, and adjust these in that manner. So we're going to do it. Now, normally I would bring the whites down until nothing is bleeding through onto the black palette. And then for the blacks, I'll hold that Alt or Option key down, and I'll bring that a little further so we get a little more bleeding through. That's just my personal taste. Now that I did it though, I'm going to look at the image and these rays, I still want those prominent. So I'm going to go to whites. I know the whites will adjust the rays, you know, quite often, you know, or in this instance should adjust the rays. And I'm going to just adjust the whites without pressing the um, Alt or Option key just to see if I could maximize the um, the contrast between the rays and the clouds behind them. Now that looks pretty good right there so far. Alright, now I um I kinda like it, it's coming along. What I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a graduated filter to further enhance the sky. So we could close down the basic panel. We're gonna go to the graduated filter. Remember it's the third tool from the right in the tool strip. We did this in the last episode. I'm gonna reset it by double clicking on effect that resets the sliders. In this case here, um, I'm going to turn contrast up and clarity up. Um, then I'm going to pull it straight down. And I don't want to go crooked or anything like that. So I'm going to hold the shift key down, which will force it to go straight down. All right. Now, as you look down here on the toolbar, I have the show edit pins be in auto. So that means when I'm hovering over the image it's showing the graduated filter and when I come off the graduated filter um, tool overlay goes away and that's the way I like to use it now if you don't see this toolbar down here hit the T key on your keyboard that will make the toolbar come and go alright so I have contrast up clarity up it looks pretty cool let's mess around with the highlights here I'm gonna bring highlights down just a little bit and shadows it's pretty much not really doing anything that I think is beneficial towards the image. So we're enhancing uh, these rays best we can. Now one thing though I want to note, if you look at the graduated filter, it's going over the whole image and it's uh, affecting the lighthouse too. And I'd prefer that the graduated filter not do anything to the lighthouse or the ground around the lighthouse. So what we could do with Lightroom 6, which is a new feature, is we could brush it away. And to do that, if you look at the tool, the graduated filter tool, you see it has new edit and brush. Now this is different than the brush tool. We don't want to click up there. We want to click where it says brush. Now we have the brush controls down here as though we're really opening the brush, but you see we're really still in the graduated filter. And all these um, sliders, just leave them alone. Don't do anything to them because they're um, reflecting what we just did with the graduated filter. But what we want to do is paint it away on the lighthouse. And what we're going to do, you can see now the brush has a plus in the minute, middle. That means we're going to apply a brush stroke. We really want to take away the graduated filter. So we're going to hold the Alt or Option key. Alt if you have a PC, Option if you have a Mac. And you can see that the tool has a minus in the middle now. That means we're going to erase what we just did. Now, I have feathering very high. And I got to be careful. You can see what I just did. I, I went a little bit too far to the left. And I put kind of a white ring over here, which I didn't want to do. Oops, I did it even more. I want to paint it back. Now I'm kind of screwing up. So now because I'm screwing up, we could go up to Edit, Undo, Brush Stroke. It'll take that away. Go to Undo, Brush Stroke. We could keep stepping back. And the Command-Z is the um, 
quick key to do that. So you can just quickly hit Command Z. Now I screwed up again. See, I didn't hold the Alt or Option key down. It's hard to talk and think and paint with the brush all at the same time. So I want to undo this. So I could hit C Command Z because I have a Mac. If you have a PC, it would be Control Z. Okay, now remember, hold the Alt or Option key down. Make sure that minus sign's in there. And we're going to paint away everything down here. There's not much down here because it is a graduated filter and it's the effect isn't as strong at the bottom part of the image. Okay, so I brushed away where I don't want the graduated filter to affect, which is the tower itself. Um, now as I do it, I'm just gonna I think contrast, mess around a little more here. It's it's good. It's the way it is, it's gonna stay. So we're gonna close down the graduated filter tool. Now I'm going to jump down to the B and W HSL color B and W tab, and remember we had these um, black and white mix sliders that we could mess with. And I'm going to go right down to the blue again, and I'm going to just mess with that a little bit. Try to bring out. Now I want to avoid what I said before, making the clouds really black. Um, Aqua doesn't seem to do a lot. It's kind of brightening up the clouds a little. Uh, we did the greens before. Let's see if there's any red in the image. You can see this sign is probably has red in it right here. And as I adjust that, it's making that sign, you know, dark and light. So we'll just turn that up to make that more visible. The yellow affected the sky before. So we'll be right around there. And I don't think magenta is going to do anything. No, it doesn't. And I don't think purple will do much. No. And we did blue before, so I'm going to leave it at that. So let's kind of reassess or assess where we are. We're going to hit the backslash key. There's before and there's after. Before, after. You could hit the Y key also and just look at them side by side. Hit the Y key again and bring back the image. All right, now, you know, it's okay. Actually, I'm not super thrilled with it, but I think for the sake of this uh, demonstration. It gives you an idea of what you could do to process an image. Um, I'm going to finish off the image though. I'm going to go to the detail panel and I'm going to bring sharpening up around 70 ish. And I think in episode 5 we'll be doing this panel. Um, I should mention now in the next episode I'll be doing a portrait. I'll process a portrait and show you how you would do that. And then I believe in episode five, we'll start doing, will be the beginning of actually doing these individual tabs. And I'll start out with the noise, the detail tab, which will include sharpening and noise reduction. But right now, we're going to keep it in the 70s, around 40. That should really take care of it. We could see if there's any spots in the image by opening the spot removal tool. We could go down here to visualize spots and see if there's any spots. And there probably isn't. I don't think that's really spot. I think that's clouds. We could turn that off and on. Actually, those are birds. So what we could do is, a lot of times I recommend to my students, we're going to zoom in. You can see these are birds. It looks like dirt when the birds are way off in the distance. You can see there's like a flock of birds there and three birds right here. Um, just clone them out with the spot removal tool because it just looks like dirt. If I printed this, it will just look like specks of dirt. So we're going to open up the spot removal tool. And um, until we cover this in more detail, remember just use heal mode, um, opacity around 100, and keep feathering fairly high. Uh, you could adjust the size of the tool with the right bracket key makes it bigger, left bracket key makes it smaller. If you have a mouse with the center wheel, that will adjust it also and make the center circle just slightly bigger than the spot you're removing. Click on it and it will sample an area that it you know, thinks will work and as you can see the overlay is there and when I come off the overlay disappears and you can see the birds are gone. If you don't like where it's sampled you could hover over where it's sampled and you can see your cursor turns into a little hand and you could actually move it around and sample a different area if you so choose. So I didn't show you that last time. Now we want to get rid of these. So we're going to make it just slightly bigger than the birds itself and click on it. And it may take a second to render. Um, right now, I changed my setup a little. Those of you that watched my um, 
previous Lightroom videos in Lightroom 5, um, I was I use I shoot the videos on a MacBook uh, with a SSD drive, which is lightning fast. But um, I since have taken my Lightroom library and I put it on a separate drive, so everything's a little slower now because I have it I have the files actually on a separate external drive, so everything is slower with the MacBook with the external drive. Uh, typically though personally I use an iMac that um, is much faster and has much more memory than my MacBook and um, it just is a lot quicker uh, doing things so things are a little slower when I work I like doing the videos on the MacBook because um, the resolution is better you could see things a little better so we got rid of the spots I closed down the spot removal tool and I could click on the image and it will zoom back out so um, that's the detail panel we got rid of some of the spots lens corrections now you may wonder why I do this at the end one thing you'll find it, it doesn't happen to me that often but when you do lens corrections it uses a lot of computing power and if you do lens corrections right at the beginning and then you go up and you start using the brush tool the graduated filter and these other tools Lightroom will lag a lot and you'll find your cursor will be popping around and not be smooth and it will just drive you crazy and that's because the computer is using so much processing power it is not rendering your screen properly and jumping all around so that's why I tend to do lens corrections towards the end you could always pop back up and do minor adjustments if lens correction screwed something up or made something look considerably different so that's why I do it at the end and I get a lot of questions from people why don't you do it right at the beginning well that's why so uh, basic panel I'm gonna enable profile corrections as you can see and it brought out some some distortions we're gonna remove chromatic aberration even though it's a black and white image there really isn't anything to worry about but it doesn't hurt to click that we're gonna go to profile though and just look and make sure that my lens showed up it was um, a full frame uh, Nikon lens everything is there everything's fine so we're closing down lens corrections one thing you could do too uh, I didn't mention if you hit the I key on your keyboard you'll get some information I for information you can see this is the name of the file it's a Nikon raw file I took this a couple years ago almost a year and a half ago and it's a D800E so it's a super large file you can hit I key again and it shows I used 1 60th of a second at F10 ISO 100 and I was using a 28 to 300 millimeter lens at 116 millimeters to take this image so that just gives you info you could hit I again and that goes away just so you could know that you know in case you ever want to see what focal length you used or something like that now I like to add a vignette and let's add a little vignette around minus 13 is good I think and that's it I'm pretty much done so that's how I would convert an image to black and white and process it tell you the truth as I mentioned I'm not super thrilled with how this one came out but I'm shooting it off the cuff and doing it as we go and I probably spend a lot more time playing with it I think the clouds are a little bit too dark up here and I'd, um, I'd prefer to probably go back and readjust those so the, but again it's personal choice and what you guys feel um, you like to do it you know just do it and you know put the naysayers aside and do it the way you like it now again I didn't mention this in the last video and sure enough I got an email when the video series is done I'll have the raw files available now they're not going to be free they're going to be part of people that buy the videos uh, the videos will always be free they'll always be streamable on YouTube and on my website but a lot of people like to have the videos they like to own them either on their computer or they'd like to have a DVD of them for those folks that do when the video series is done which hopefully will be in a couple weeks you'll be able to buy all the videos and you'll included with that will be the raw files alright so I just wanted to let everyone know alright I appreciate everyone uh, watching my videos thank you so much and all everyone who likes them I get a thrill thanks a lot and shares them that really helps get the word out uh, when you share my videos thank you so much and remember subscribe to my YouTube channel so you don't miss a new video alright I'll talk to you guys soon